This episode of The Citadel Cafe is brought to you by listeners like you. Visit patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe to find out how you can become a patron and help make this show possible. This is the Citadel Cafe, episode number 479 for Wednesday, April 3rd, 2024. My name is Joel Duggan and the Citadel Cafe is where my friends and I hang out to talk about the geeky stuff that we are into. This show is available on all of the major podcasting platforms as well as YouTube. If you're enjoying the show, hit that free subscribe button wherever you're listening. It really does help us out a lot. Joining me this week, Stephen ESC is back. It is the first Wednesday of the month, so we have the first Stephen ESC appearance of the month. <laughs> Surprisingly, or unsurprisingly, you can find Stephen ESC, that's Stephen with a PH, by the way, on Twitch and on social media, where it matters, under that name. Hello, sir. Hello, hello. How are you? I am doing good. I am in the midst of intermittent fasting, and oh. I... It's weird. Like I, I'm not too bad about not eating late at night because I find that the short window of eating, when I get my meal in around six thirty or seven, um, I've had so much to eat in like a six hour window, ish, that I'm not hungry late at night. Right. That's good. Yeah. The only time I find it challenging is that uh, if I have a busy day at work and I don't get to the gym and start lifting until five. Then I'm not getting home until 6.30. By the time I'm out of the shower and cooking dinner, like I'm sitting down to 7.30. So like it's a little mm. hard to get it done under, you know, into eight. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not a slave to somebody else's clock the following day. So it's not like I have to take lunch at noon. If I eat past eight one night, I'll just eat lunch at one or two the next day, you know, or, right. or, or break the fast at, at that time. Uh, I do find that the combination of strength training and intermittent fasting is quite challenging the following morning. I don't very often make it to <laughs> noon. I get to about 11 and then I just start cooking at 11, which it starts to like at least satisfy my craving. Like, okay, food is coming. Smelling is happening. Like I, I'm, I'm not like dying. So the day after I find a big workout, I, it's difficult because your body is like repairing. It's just like need the building blocks. <laughs> there are no blocks. <laughs> you are, you are running on empty after we finished everything that you gave us last night. So, uh, but other than that, I... I like it. I think the only tricky part again with training is trying to hit the protein goals when you're only having an eight hour, often a two meal window. So right. I've been trying to figure out different alternatives for like a protein snack. I've got to find a protein powder that I actually like. I'm picky about that kind of stuff. I tried one from Costco that was plant-based horrible <laughs> oh because that's the that's the sound that you make no matter what you mix it with it still that's tastes funny. like powder like you're just like meh no thanks i think it i think the major protein in it was pea protein which is it's the best kind of protein if you're going all veggie and i just did it because it was cheaper and i thought well hey that's better for you right but no because sometimes whey protein depending on the brand will irritate my stomach so I went with something that was probably not going to irritate my stomach. And it didn't do that. Like that part was fine. It was just like stomaching it as far as the taste goes was just like, nope, not into it. Yeah. There was one that I found online at Amazon. Not that I'm looking to give Amazon a ton of money, but they have basically, I I mean, you know, I've talked about my digestive issues before. And so if I can't do whey and any dairy based ones. And then I don't digest things like peas and lentils very well. So the, 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 the pea protein isolate ones don't work for me well either. And so I'll have to try to, I'll have to find out what it was. There was, it was relatively reasonably priced. It, I mean, that is, if you're interested in the veggie one, I'll find it again. And then well.ca, like the Canadian kind of company for vitamins and things like that. I think they've got it as well. And so if you buy, if I bought two of them from them, then it would be free shipping. But from Amazon, it was only, only needed the one. So it was pretty good. I was, I was pleasantly surprised by the quality. And it, and it, I could stir it with a fork in a cup. And, oh, wow. Okay. And there was only one time that it clumped up. So it was actually, but it, it, 
it wasn't gritty or grainy or anything like that. It, it was overall probably one of the better protein shake experiences I had. I have a hand blender. It's like a, it's a, it's a combination immersion blender, but it has like an attachment that you can like take the immersion part off and put on like a whisk. So like you can just oh, yeah. put your shake into like a single tall, kind of like a tall boy cup and then just like mm. immerse the, the, the single whisk and just like rip, just one minute. And if it's a good powder or if you're just making, um, for me, like if I was making jello or something like that, because one of the tricks I used to use way back in the day when I was bodybuilding and I was in university and I didn't want to lug around like liquid because you're just worried about it spilling in your backpack all day long. Right. So when I was weight gaining, what I used to do was I used to have cottage cheese, protein powder, uh, a little bit of milk to thin it down and jello pudding mix. And so I would take it in like a, a plastic Tupperware to the art studio and I would be able to eat half of it in the morning and half of it in the afternoon, like kind of it, like 10 o'clock and two o'clock. And it's a little bit extra sugar. Like it's not the best for you. It's not super high calorie, but it's, it's because it's mostly protein because you're what you're mixing with it. But, but because it's, it's basically comes out like a, almost like a soft cheesecake. So there's no risk of spilling in your backpack, <laughs> right? Like the whole thing That's could cool. be upside down and it doesn't matter. And you know, like you learn your lesson once and cleaning protein shake out of a book bag. <laughs> <laughs> it's not something you ever want to do again after you have to oh, do it no once. <laughs> so, and the milk smell like, like it was just, yeah, like that baby too, formula. Yeah. Oh, it was rotten. It was not, it was not fun at all to, to do that. I mean, like I caught it right away. It's not like it stank stank, but it was just, it was, it was hard to get that smell out of the book bag. It just smelled like vanilla for like a week, but mm. it just, it did just kind of remind you every time <laughs> you did something, you're just like, all right, I was an idiot. And like, I didn't screw on the top to my, you know, my drink canister or whatever. And this was like, you know, 97, 98. So there wasn't a lot of <laughs> decent tech these days. Like the bottles and things that people bring with them are like super duper foolproof and all that stuff. Bulletproof probably. Yeah. But, but back then there was, yeah, there was some issues. Also, also a poor student. So even if there were nice ones, I couldn't afford them anyway. But yeah, that was a, another lifetime ago, but I haven't, I haven't been doing that because working from home, I just, I try to do food. Like I just, I prefer to get protein from food. And I feel like when you do that, you're also more full than when you're doing a shake. And, mm -hmm. and I find that I also then snack less and all that kind of stuff. And I'm not trying to go crazy. Um, I just, I want to just maintain the level because I'm trying to cut and I don't want to cut and, and lose all the work that I've done over the last 18 months, you know, trying to get back into the swing of things at the gym. So Anyway, that's, that's a real personal, personal health, <laughs> weightlifting nerd, <laughs> I guess, area. So I have been listening to a lot of different podcasts and stuff lately about just personal health and different strategies and, and things like that. And, um, it's been on my mind as of late, uh, before we move on, are you, are you still working out at home? Like, is that some, something that you, you are doing or hope to be doing as the, the nicer weather comes back? I know that you, you get out for runs from time to time. Yeah, it's it's been a while. I haven't been as good at it as I had originally hoped. We were, my son and I were working at it, and we were doing quite well with it, but it was, like, we would wake up early before work and then go for a walk, and then just for fun, my family, we like to do hacky sack, so we would actually do hacky sack as part of the warm-up. Oh, cool. And then, then we would, yeah, and then by that point, you're, you're, you know, between the two of us, we're reaching and lunging all over the place trying to keep the hacky sack in the air. And so when we come when we come home, we are... We're basically warmed up temperature wise and warmed up sort of stretch wise just because of all the moving we've been doing and then and then we got into it. So but then it was almost as almost as soon as the time changed last year, um, in the fall, it seemed to get really cold as well, and then it just sort of ruined it for us. And then we just weren't able to find our groove because we, we still wanted to warm up, but we couldn't find a really good way to warm up in our house because it's an old house and if you jump around then the entire <laughs> the entire room shakes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we've been with the, the sun being out longer these days. We've been, you know, been looking at each other, going, "Okay, it's gonna happen soon. We're gonna be want to get back into it." But yeah, between me having a cold and then the shingles, then the cold, and then just the low energy, it's it's taking longer getting back into back into the swing of things that I would like. It's been a, a rough couple weeks, eight weeks for you, give or take. I mean, we had a, a podcast scheduled for last month, but obviously you had to bow out because you weren't feeling well. And, and which is, I mean, obviously, you know, take care of yourself first. Real life comes before podcast. 
uh, as I mentioned to you when, yeah. when you were apologizing about not being able to make it, it's like, dude, <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. Like you're not just like tired. You're ill, like fix yourself. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's the old, the old airplane rule. Like put your mask on before you put the kid's mask on. <laughs> like that's, yeah, that's how exactly. it goes. Right. Um, yeah. but yeah, it's, uh, I, I've, I've not been ill, but I've definitely been feeling more tired. Now I have been going to the gym more and I don't know whether that's helping or hindering because I, I find it really frustrating sometimes because I've been having sleep issues and I am absolutely bewildered when I get home from like leg day and then go to bed at a reasonable time. Cause I am tired. I'm, I'm sl- I'm slumping on the couch. I'm like, okay, time, time to get off the couch screen, phone, whatever you're doing and just get ready for bed and call it a night, you know, 10 30, something normal. And then I see 12 30 and I was like, why? And I'm not on my yeah. phone. I'm not, you know, like I'm just, I'm staring at the ceiling or the back of my eyelids. And he's like, I've been here long enough that I'm uncomfortable and I have to use the bathroom. So like, it's obviously been at least an hour. And, yeah. and you're just like, what on God's green earth? Like I have to walk six kilometers total to and from the gym, probably closer to seven. I'm doing, I did legs yesterday. So that I don't know how many hundreds of pounds I'm moving around, like not in one go, but like you're squatting, I'm doing like 155 or something for sets of eight. And then you do that for four or five different exercises. And you're just like, that's a lot. <laughs> I should be just dead to the world, yeah. you know? Should, and, you should have been asleep before your head hit the pillow. Yeah. Like my body is like, must be horizontal. And my brain is like, so <laughs> what are we going <laughs> to think about tonight? It's like, come on, man. Like, <laughs> give me a break. Give me a break. So, uh, yeah, I just, uh, like I said, not been ill and, and, but I feel like there has been something in the air. Everyone I talk to is overworked. Like everybody's mm-hmm. on burnout notice, uh, that I, that I have in regular circles. Everyone is just like busy complaining of like 12 hour days. If they work in a situation that that calls for it or, or they're just like super busy during the day. And it's, it's a, it's a cognitive stress. Like maybe they have a nine to five and it doesn't go over that. But like those nine to fives are like jammed with meetings and stuff. And, uh, anybody that I know that works in accounting, of course, is very busy because it's tax season and yeah, no like that kind of stuff. So it's, and I, I mean, as I mean, I have to do my, I don't do my taxes. I have an accountant that does the taxes, but I have to prep all the book work and I have to do all the prep, all the paperwork and stuff too. So I've got that on my list. And yeah, I just, you ever find that there's those things that you have to do that are like renewing a membership card thing or renewing some license for something. And they ultimately like involve a phone call and you're just like, oh, I'll do it later. <laughs> like <laughs> if it was like, yeah, use this email address or this website to renew your whatever. And you're like, done, sweet. Let me do it. You know, like uh, my website's coming up this month to like domains renewal. And you're just like, sure. Yeah. Noted. I'll do that when it comes up. Fine. Cause it takes 10 minutes. It's all online. It's all through PayPal, like just easy breezy done. And, uh, when it comes to like old school government stuff. We're like, you have to call this number. I'm like, oh, <laughs> have you ever done the, the whole stats Canada thing before where they, they call you and ask you questions about employment and hours worked and stuff? No, <laughs> thankfully. Oh, uh, got, yeah, I had to do that this year and man, those conversations are long and tedious. Mm-hmm. I'd rather do without those. Thank you. Send me to your secure website. I'll do four versions of two factor authentication. If I don't have to talk to a person. And they do have a, they do have a, an online version of it, but they give you this little teeny tiny window of time to do it online oh, before they like email you and then eventually call you. And so it's like, oh my goodness, I've been busy. It's been three days since I got your email. Just, just stop it. <laughs> so without getting into politics or too much in Canada, because we've got, you know, a worldwide audience, but like everybody in this country is focused on probably a lot of work and trying to make ends meet. And when you ask them to like, oh, hey, drop everything for this thing for the Canadian government, you're like, I'm busy trying not to be out on the street. (laughs) Yeah. You know, right now for the vast majority of Canadians. And uh, I can see that not being a top priority. I'll I'll be glad when this, when it's over. Hope it never happens again. Well, speaking of priorities, I try to prioritize geeky stuff for pastimes whenever I can. What have you been up to since the last time we had you on the show? Maybe less on the geeky side, but it's sort of been one of those things that it's occupying my mind all the time. It's like I've been trying to teach myself how to do how to do sign language. So ASL for in it's what we use in North America. I shouldn't say we like I'm a pro at it or anything like that. But I've been just it's been one of those things that's been on my sort of my life bucket list for a while just because I feel like it's like learning another language. I like 
you know, I, I know French quite well and I've been wanting to learn other languages, but it, it also feels like one of those things that's just, it's like a good and right thing to do in my mind. Not that everyone has to do it, but it feels like there have been situations at previous jobs where people come in and, and they, they can't hear you and they don't talk and they, so they want to sign or they want to write it out and type it, type back and forth kind of thing. And it's just, it just feels like, yeah, it's just been something I've been wanting to do for a while. So I've been just playing with as many apps as I can. So I've been fell down the rabbit hole of trying to find the best resources and yeah, use a combination of websites, apps, YouTube videos, and just yeah, trying to soak it in as much as possible. That's awesome. I, yeah. uh, I have a, an acquaintance from years ago that actually went through the NSCC, I want to say. Oh yeah. Certification program. Cool. And is an interpreter now. Like that's, that's their job. And that's really cool. Yeah, no, very, very cool. And, and once they got into it and comfortable into it and started like, they've, they always liked it, but then they, you know, you fall in love with learning a new language. And then, uh, like you were saying, like the ability to help people that, in the vast majority of situations can only talk with somebody if they're also, you know, fluent in ASL. Um, mm-hmm. The fact that you can do that for someone and make them feel seen, heard, understood, uh, helped, all that kind of stuff. Very fulfilling work, depending on, you know, what sector that you're doing your translations in. And uh, I mean, dude, I'm like, that's awesome. I, uh, I've definitely Thanks. been jealous of your bilingualism with French. And I've thought about picking up another language for a while there. I was thinking about vacationing in Mexico and I was going to pick up Mm. some Spanish just to kind of, you know, be respectful and learn all the pleases and thank yous and all that kind of stuff. And I was looking at, I think it's, what are the two popular apps? There's Duolingo and then there's another one. I think Um, the Duolingo, I think is the one that I see advertised the most, but there's a couple of apps out there that are apparently very good at teaching you the essentials of a second language. Uh, Do you find that there was one kind of king app for ASL or was it like you have to kind of mishmash a bunch of other stuff together to get it to work? Well, the, um, the, the best app that I found is, has kind of a, a paywall, unfortunately. So it's originally, there's a, a free lesson that goes along with it and it looks like, yeah, gives you enough time to go. Yeah, this looks like the one. And then it's, you know, $150 plus tax a year. and A year? Wow. But when you think about like, because I thought about trying trying to actually do in-person lessons as well, which would cost a bit more. Um, but I'd be, I don't have the cash right now, but like I'm, I'd be tempted to at some point maybe try paying for it for a month and see. But I, I was going to save it for my um, my internet minute at the end. But the, the big resource that I've been enjoying the most, it's... um lifeprint.com um the website's horrible it's like (laughs) it's just a text-based thing only with frames and stuff it is just not a good website at all visually but um the the instructor uh dr bill vicker he's i've only watched a handful of the videos so far but he's engaging friendly um he repeats things a lot as well so he'll like teach you how to do um again and lesson and me and you and there and all of the different signs. But then he'll like, once he teaches them to you, he'll, he'll do a little bit of a lesson thing on the side and then he stops. Then he'll put a sign up on the TV screen behind him and just kind of gestures to it. And then the student there has to do the sign over and over again. So within a, like a 45 minute YouTube video, you'd probably be doing the same signs maybe 10 times, maybe more in some cases, maybe less, but all of the other apps that I've used so far, when you're learning them, they just show it to you once. And then you have to then, it's it's more on you to do the repeating of it. So if you don't get it, but you don't realize you don't get it. Some, sometimes in the apps, you don't realize you don't get it until they test you on it later. And you go, oh, I don't remember what that was. But but the, yeah, the life print videos, it's just, it's a lot of reiteration, which I've been finding very enjoyable and they're available for free. So it is uh, up my alley in terms of content and price. I feel like that repetition is more of an, I don't say it's not a newer learning model, but it's certainly away from the academic way of learning. Whereas you have to, here's the information, memorize it, regurgitate it once on a test for a mark. And I remember things changing for me by leaps and bounds when I got into university and I was not taking multiple subjects throughout 
everything, science, math, art, all that stuff. It was just art. And I mean, mm -hmm. different kinds of art, photography and printmaking and drawing and all that kind of stuff. But the thing that I found most uh, rewarding was drawing because that was my focus. But when you're studio drawing three hours a day, every day, I think we only had one day a week where we didn't have a life drawing class. Uh, you just, uh -huh. you get better as long as you're trying, like if you're trying to improve, yeah. it's the mileage, you know? And, and I feel like when you're learning a language, I would imagine repetition or repetition in context where you have to learn a thing and then use it, you know, for example, use the word or the phrase that you just learned in ASL over and over again in several different kinds of situations. Yeah. Uh, I, I feel like that could be, that could be quite useful. And I know that from a couple of YouTube videos that I was watching about Mexico vacations and expats and stuff, uh, they were saying that everybody tries their best when they want to learn a language to learn before they get here and realize quite quickly that they've either learned wrong or there's so many different subtleties <laughs> because like you're learning a formal part of the language and then you get into some place where there's different dialects and different areas, different accents and different part of the country. Mexico is huge. Yeah. And then also just immersion and slang and like just different age groups. Like it's going to matter if you're talking to somebody that's in their fifties versus somebody that's 14, you know, like that kind of stuff. And, mm -hmm. and they say that it's the best way to really learn and get a handle on it is just get the pleasantries down so you can be polite in a customer service situation and then find some friends locally that are willing to teach you because quite honestly, they're usually also trying to help their own English. So you can kind of help one another. And then it's, the, it's that immersion. It's that repetition that ends up speeding you along once you're there in the country for two weeks, you know, and then whether that's Mexico or Sweden or like wherever you're going. Yeah. I think that because even though I don't speak French, I did learn some French in school. And I feel like because it's a Latin based language, Spanish would also be probably something I could pick up relatively quickly. Yeah, Spanish has been one of the ones on my list for a while now, but it's, it's I don't have I don't have a practical use for it. And so if if I learned it, I would probably lose it relatively quickly. And and that's one of the things I'm worrying about I worry about a little bit with the sign language is I don't have anyone to talk right to with it. But if I keep watching videos and and that's one of the things I want to keep trying to do. I guess that's one of the things that's nice as well. I don't necessarily I won't lose the pronunciation <laughs> as weird as that sounds. I mean, I'd probably lose, I guess in a similar way, lose the clarity of signs that I do, but, but yeah, Spanish has been one of those ones on my list as well. I've got, I've, I've got probably four different languages I want to learn. And so I've got, <laughs> I've got some work to do. Well, I have not been nearly as productive with my free time. <laughs> uh, I've been tiptoeing back into no man's sky there was an orbital update which is version 4.6 of the game on the 28th or 29th of march was hmm. watching a lot of stuff on youtube about it because there was some weird delay and the update did not hit the xbox slash game pass store until monday this so april 1st i think is when it came out and it was late on the first because i don't think i even got to it until tuesday um, but the orbital update made a lot of changes to the space stations in the game. And for anybody that's not familiar, every system that you travel to in No Man's Sky, it's a sci-fi kind of sandbox space adventure game. Every system has a, has a base, like has a star base, uh, has a, a space station. And they were very much the same. They were very poorly laid out. And it was always tedious because you could never remember which side of the base things were on. And if you went to the wrong side, it's, it's like going to the mall and realizing that you parked in the wrong parking lot and you have to walk across the mall to get to the store that you want. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that kind of stuff. And when you're in a game that has a lot of like make busy activities and um, things that make you want to do things fast, but then the game really makes it hard to do anything quickly. And I struggle with that aspect of the game, but the new space stations are very cool. They've reorganized them. They have made them all unique. So they're all procedurally generated. There are some shapes that are repeated here and there, but the organization of those shapes and whatnot on the outside are all unique. So it's very cool in that 
if you can't remember the complicated name of the station, you can at least know, oh, it was the purple one that looked like a bunny head. <laughs> like, oh, I know which one I'm going to. So that kind of stuff is cool. And the other thing that they added in the game, which is really what had my my ears perk up, speaking of bunnies, was the fact that you can now customize your ships. And this game is like pushing 10 years old, and they're only just now allowing you to customize your spaceship that you spend all of your time in. And uh, you could fi- you can find new ships, you could buy new ships, you can claim new ships, you can have up to 12 in your in your arsenal of or your fleet of ships. But this is the first time you've been able to switch out different parts and paint them. So it's oh, only, cool. yeah, it's very cool. It's only fighters, explorers, and haulers. So fighters are self-explanatory. Explorers are ships that have really powerful hyperdrives and allow you to go system to system to system without having to stop and refuel as often. Uh, and then haulers are big buses. It's like having an 18 wheeler. So if you have a lot of material, like say you found a really cool planet and you want to bring all kinds of stuff there to build, then you use your hauler because you can just bring tons and tons and tons of stuff. Uh, or if you're selling something from one of your mineral farms and you want to like get a big dump and, and get a lot of money all at once, you can use your hauler for that. And so they break it down into wings, fuselage, which is like the body and the nose, the engines, which is like the back part with the little blasters that show that the engine's working and a core. And the core is like a different stages. It's like uh, B, C, A, and S are the three different, four different tiers, S being the top class. And then what's cool about some of the ships, the explorers are asymmetrical. So if you like a certain type of wing, you don't have to have it on both sides. You can actually say, oh, I'm going to have this explorer on the left wing and then this explorer wing on the right wing. So it can be kind of asymmetrical, kind of like a B wing from Star Wars, Mm. if that makes sense. And, and a lot of them have that kind of gyroscope feel to them. They often have round cockpits and so they can get their, their fuselage kind of spins around and there's all this kind of cool stuff. So I do hope that they expand to the other ships because there's a, there's shuttles. There's, I want to say freighter is different than hauler and there's solar ships. There's a couple of other different ships, but some of them are like tied to expedition missions. So I can see them not letting you customize those because the idea for those is that you have to complete this mission and then the reward at the end of the mission is the new ship. So I can see them maybe not doing that. Um, But I'd like to see um, more parts. What, What I would really like to see is being able to paint ships that you find. So there's now that they've got these custom ships in the game, there's two different designations. There's an authenticated ship, which would be I found this, it's special. This is how it came. Uh, I went, I did the mission, or I found this just randomly on a planet. And this is just, this how it, it is how it came. And it was RNG from the game and I was really happy with it. So if you have that authenticity stamp on it, then people will know you didn't build it. That's right. how it came, Actually. right? Uh, and then if you see certain colors, like certain ships, there's, they're never purple. So if you see certain pink or purple or certain color combos, you'll know, okay, that's, that's a ship that someone built because just, you can't get those colors naturally in, in game. So I would love to be able to take something like, uh, the Twitch reward ship that I got from a, a drop. I can rename it. I can't remember what it was called before, but I called it the blue talon because it's a very long pointy ship. It looks kind of like a, a, an eagle claw and I'd like it to not be blue. It's not bad. It's like a nice Corvette blue, but I kind of would want it to be white or black or like, I'd like to do something cool with it. And because it's an authentic ship, I can't change anything about it. And the cool thing is if you, if you make a ship, then you can repaint it as often as you want. I think from what I can tell. So, uh, I might try to find a bunch of different parts that look like, or even improve upon this blue talon, make that. And then I can transfer hopefully all of the bits from the blue talent into the new thing and then have like my black ship or whatever cool thing that I want. Um, but because I've not played the game in a long time and because I'm playing on a relatively new save on Xbox game pass, I was much earlier on in the game than I was with my other save. So you have all these things that you want to do and you realize that you're hamstrung by just not having enough progression in the game. I don't have a home base. I don't have a mineral farm. Like it's kind of like day one Mm. in Minecraft. If you want to build a castle, Day one in Minecraft is not the day you get to build the castle, yeah. <laughs> you know, like it's not it's, with your wooden axe. No, exactly. So, so that kind of stuff has been 
has been cool um, to at least dabble in. I did get to to salvage a couple of ships, and I I can see that it's going to be a rewarding process once you get going. And the people at Endgame that have a lot more money and can just buy the different things and and have the ships that get them around to pick up the stuff faster, obviously, will get into the custom ships a lot faster than new people will. But the fact that it's there is nice. It's very straightforward to understand and see what you need to do. It's just a matter of whether you have the time to do it. And the nice thing about moving my gameplay from Steam to Xbox Game Pass, and that's not that I'm transferring the save. It's more like I'm just, I'm, I started over several months ago on, on Game Pass and it, it saves across platform. So because I have Xbox Game Pass Ultimate, it also means I have access to, to No Man's Sky on the PC, which means that if I want to stream it, it's there to stream. And if I decide I don't want to stream this, tonight i just want to chill on the couch and fly around and collect some stuff i can do that and that progress is saved and synced with this with the same um game so i can stream do some stuff on stream and then if i'm playing on the couch two days later it's going to pick up where the stream left off so that's really cool i cross save yeah yeah, cross save these days cloud saving like just games that don't have it are just shooting themselves in the foot if they're on more than one platform right so um so yeah i'm i'm liking it. it it's very pretty on the Xbox as well. I don't think my computer really holds up graphically on No Man's Sky, even though it's a fairly simple game in terms of like, it's kind of cartoony, the lighting effects and all the cool stuff. Plus I've got the Govi lights behind my TV in the living room. So it's really, it's really cool to play on the big screen. There's something really cool about flying a spaceship on a big TV. It just, it feels a lot different than a 27 inch monitor. So, (laughs) so that's been fun. Yeah, not a fan of the controls in the Xbox. That's my one gripe is that the controller cannot be remapped. There's a couple things like you can switch the joystick versus up and down. You can change a couple of scan buttons, but really there's a bunch of stuff that I want them to change so so I can have like a better experience. And they, it just it's really backwards. So a really good example is that when you're flying a ship, the trigger is your acceleration. And the A button is your weapons. I have Mm. never played a game on the Xbox that you shoot where the trigger isn't shooting. (laughs) So (laughs) there's so many times I've had a bad guy ship in my sights and I've just basically floored it at him and just like, well, that's not (laughs) useful at all. I've Uh, I've flown by you very quickly. Yes. Take that. Yes. And to you, sir. (laughs) <laughs> yeah it's <laughs> it's not yeah it's it's not the best uh so there there are challenges like that uh especially because i'm coming off of just playing more halo infinite and so my my brain is just like zoom in and shoot zoom in and shoot and it's like i'm hitting break and gas and break and gas like neither one of those are what i want <laughs> you know and and honestly dog fighting on on a xbox controller is not great it's easier with a mouse and keyboard if you can believe it i'd much rather have a joystick but my joystick is so old that it wouldn't work with my PC anyway. So hmm. anyway, that's, that's the nerdy thing that I, I have been up to as far as my pastimes, but I'm looking forward to playing a little bit more. I, I may just leave it as my couch game. Like it's a really good nine o'clock at night. I don't want to go to bed right now, but I, you know, I like an hour to kill and it's a nice way to do some stuff. That's not requiring you to be on the edge of your seat. It's not like precision racing. It's not halo where you have to be not, getting shot at like there's it's a little bit more laid back so that it might be my go-to kind of evening game for the time being moving into the main discussion this week we've got a couple of uh movies and a series to talk about why don't you kick us off what have you been up to on the the big or small screen uh on the well on the big screen i caught dune 2 recently which was amazing and on the small screen i've been watching a show called three body problem um actually i guess i'll talk about that one first and the it kind of pleasantly caught me by surprise i didn't really know anything about it just saw that it was it's on netflix saw that it was from the creators of game game of thrones and i thought oh that seems interesting so all i knew about it going into it was from like the little teaser trailer that they show and it's uh it's based off the novel the three body problem by a chinese science fiction author i'm going to mess this name up and i apologize but Liu Xichin. It's the first novel in the Remembrance of Earth's Past trilogy. So it's um it's really intriguing. And so I'm, I'm <laughs> I was trying to think of the best way to talk about it. And it's almost one of those things where I don't want to give too much away because there were pretty neat reveals 
throughout the beginning, like the first few episodes of the show that I think if I, if I talk about it in a way, it just be, it would ruin it for some people. But, but I went into it not, not knowing anything about it. And it starts off with this feel that's like a mix of sci-fi and detective drama, which was, or like, um, CSI type thing where they're trying to figure out why certain people are, why certain scientists are dying. Basically it starts off in, I think it's, 1960, 1970, China, and then it flips back and forth between, yeah, the past in China and present day England. And it opens up with basically, I guess it starts off and basically scientists are just sort of quitting because something's happening with, in one place with a particle accelerator that is basically ruining all of, something happened where all of the data in an and a particle accelerator went wrong, basically disproving everything physics based that they've known for the past 60 years. Like, well, that's not supposed to happen. And yet it's happened. And we've, you know, it's not, hap not just happening at our particle accelerator. It's happening somewhere else. Then there's these weird things that are happening in the sky that everyone can see. And it's just, it's a lot of really interesting stuff. Had a bit of an X, X files vibe to it as well. Uh, my wife and I have watched a couple more episodes since I prepared these notes. So I I know a lot more now about what's going on. But if I start to talk about it, then it's going to sort of really ruin the, the reveals in it. But it's it's pretty good. I'm enjoying it more than I thought I would for a show that I didn't really know anything about. This is all super, super vague. But it's got some um, some neat... They have these VR um, headsets in there that are very, very advanced and very cool. And sort of reveal to the characters different plot points that they are basically they're being led to figure out so it's it's not even so not everyone is fully in control of the narrative so there's there's actually some like you know greater powers that be that are kind of yeah in the mix stirring things up i apologize this is like super super vague but it's um really quite enjoying it right now it's like eight episodes pretty solid show so far so if anybody's kind of looking for something interesting and a little bit in the sci-fi realm i recommend giving it a go it's on netflix um just came out this year I've heard good things from headlines, from very brief recommendations on other podcasts. And I have recently discontinued Netflix for the time being just because there wasn't anything on at the moment that I wanted to watch. Oh, yeah. But uh, I mean, I'll, it's a Netflix uh, original, is it not? It is, yes. Yeah, so it's not going anywhere. So that's good. So that it'll be there when I get back. Because I've been definitely itching for a sci-fi show to watch. Uh, ever since Halo two season two ended, and I don't think I've talked about it on this show, which I won't get into that today. But um, I just I really was amped up for like more sci fi and a sci fi series to watch that that wasn't like post apocalyptic doom something that was a little bit more interesting. You and I had a lot to talk about the peripheral when we were talking about it here on yeah on Citadel Cafe. And then it got canceled. Yeah, no, I and I I realized that, but but it got points for me for being different. You know, it, it, it oh, definitely, sure. definitely steps outside of what I, I would consider like a, like the normal run of the mill sci-fi that we normally see. And, um, from what I've heard about this and from what you say also, um, about the Game of Thrones creators, then, uh, that sounds intriguing to me. I like the twisty, you know, kind of sci-fi plots and the, there's something that I like about sci-fi films or series where it's it's sort of like Jurassic Park where like some there's one thing or or a set of things within this realm of either physics or biology or something that happens that like take the human experience forward faster than it can comprehend and mm -hmm. it just has this huge what if this happened vibe and i find that a lot more intriguing than like Star Trek or Star Wars you know not that i don't like either one of those i do but there's something really interesting about like people that are like, even like you said, a decade ago or two, several decades ago, uh, seeing this stuff and then modern day seeing this stuff and still being baffled by it and, and the knock on effects of it. And I think that's an interesting examination of the human condition and about how people's psyche react to stuff like that. So I think it's one of the reasons why Jurassic Park was such a huge hit is because the science that the novel kind of sprung from, it wasn't like, solid but it was like a theory it's like this is yeah potentially possible and yeah if you take that and just take the stick and run with it 
then you can come up with some really really cool stuff so and that's it sounds like that's what three body problem is like like they took some things that we know and said okay what if we just push it just a little bit to the point where something concrete happens in this direction or that direction and what are the knock-on effects of that yeah and, and they get into stuff like um they t- talk about quantum physics a little bit and um dimensions beyond our third or three dimensions kind of thing and so i don't know enough about that to know if what they were talking about falls within the realm of plausible in those fields of science but the way they explained it enough the way they explained it felt i see where you're going with that enough to me to allow the story to keep going in my mind like i wasn't they didn't do something that made me go well that's stupid click and shut it off but it's even it's got some weird things like some of the characters see a countdown and and, and this is not anything huge this is from the trailer like they're just in a bar and then randomly this countdown appears in front of their eyes and they, they just see it all the time and they have no idea why and so these are these are the things that i'm talking about the reveals as to, to why that countdown is there in front of this one person one person's eyes but no one else's I, th- I think your comparison to the peripheral is pretty bang on in the sense that it's it feels like it's just sort of new and it's got some gruesome parts in it they're not crazy crazy violent or anything like that but it's like this slow motion gruesome which is just some, done in a way that i have never seen before so it's it's a uh, yeah you'll you'll know it when it's about to happen when you when you're watching the show so that if you <laughs> if you want to avert your eyes you can it's just it's not like you're you're uh, jump scared with gruesomeness it's 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 a really interesting show I've got some actors i recognize too i really liked liam cunningham he's from game of thrones and oh yeah Benedict Wong from Marvel. Yeah, he's there too. And then, and then also from Game of Thrones, you've got uh, John Bradley who played uh, Sam. Oh, nice. John Snow, John Snow's friend on the wall. So, yep. Jonathan Price is great. I like Jonathan Price. Oh yeah, yeah. He's in. He's in uh, that show on Prime that I never finished. Oh, what was the name of it? It was another sci-fi show, and it was all kind of like one-off serials. It was like The Twilight Zone. It was really weird. Really, oh, really weird um, price. Is it, um, b- they're based on sci-fi paintings, was it? Tales from the Loop. Ah, I started that too. I think I've watched two episodes. Was really intrigued by it. But then my wife and I just couldn't find the time to go back and watch it. Because there's some there were some things in it that were like disturbing enough that made us kind of go, well, I feel like that's not something we may want to watch right before bed. <laughs> there was also i'm like maybe four episodes in or something like that and the third one was slow or the fourth one was slow and it's hard when it's not a consistent narrative it's right. like they're all one-offs and it's all set in the same town but it's they're all approached so differently and then if one is like really slow or really sad or really off-putting you're just like ah how many of those are there gonna be yeah and you don't have the plot to like well i, I want to see how it goes so i want to come back and watch the next one because you just you don't know what you're going to get served up and i think that's one issue with anthology series like that it's it was the same with star wars uh visions is in that some of them are awesome and then other ones you're just like you're on your phone the whole time going like when is this over (laughs) you know because it's just it's just it's and it's not that they're bad it's just that they sometimes they just don't appeal to you like they're too kiddy or they're Mm. weird or there's a song and you're like i don't want singing in my star wars so stuff like that is uh is difficult with anthologies i i don't know if i had the same problem with uh love death and robots i know i didn't get into the third season or the second season whenever it came out there's the occasional show in that one that I was just kind of, I sort of felt myself sliding into this, you know, bit of indifference with some of the types of, there's a couple of them are, that felt very much, you know, army gung ho, we're going to go and like yeah. shoot up these aliens kind of thing. I, I have, I find I have less and less desire to watch anything like that. The, the ones that feel like they're made by the, some of the dudes that were in my animation course when I was 20, like that's, <laughs> that that's kind of what they yeah. feel like, you know, and the ones that are really well done are like almost silent films, you know, like the, the, they feel like Wally or something. They're n- not that cutesy, yeah. but like they just, they have that kind of pathos and weight to them and without any words or anything, they just, they hook you right away. Those are the ones I really enjoy. Yeah, me too. What have you been watching? So I'll have a brief mention here because I did watch Oppenheimer. I had wanted to go see it, but then just never got around to it. And Prime Video has 
Oppenheimer for Canada for streaming, as well as several other of the Oscar nominated and Oscar winning oh, really? films. Yeah. So if you if you want to catch up on your Oscars or even just some critically acclaimed films, the the new Wes Anderson film is on Prime Video too. Um, I haven't watched it yet, but it's on my list, and they're all there. So I thought, well, that's easy. Uh, Amazon and Prime Video have increased their quality ever since the Rings of Power came out. So I don't really hesitate anymore to just watch something there. Mm. And I've not upped my subscription to pay for advertising, like avoidance, but Mm -hmm. it's like one or two ads in front of the film and that's it. It's basically like watching trailers. They don't interrupt the movie which is good because this movie is a vibe yeah. and, and having a, an Amazon ad <laughs> for whatever Amazon wants to sell me three times over during the course of a three hour movie would really ruin it. And I think they were smart enough to say like, nope, we'll do pre-roll ads. Uh, some of them are, are for just Amazon shows. You're probably going to want to watch anyway. So like there was a trailer for Roadhouse, um, that kind of stuff. Overall though, for Oppenheimer, I really enjoyed it. Good performances from everyone involved expected course giving its accolades at the oscars right killian murphy is excellent and a workhorse he is in nearly every scene and even when he's not in the scene it's like a brief bit where they're talking about him (laughs) and then they're going back to (laughs) to filming him so uh he must have been exhausted at the end of that Uh, knowing from what i've seen in interviews where how much of himself he gave to the role and uh very well done well deserved for best actor and i don't know a lot about oppenheimer i'm not a a history buff but i'm sure from the way that christopher nolan talks about his films that they did everything they could to keep it as historically accurate as possible i even heard that murphy was he he would even watch clips on and look at photos on how oppenheimer himself stood and walked around so he he, he Mm -hmm. wanted to try to physically capture his his presence as well it's pretty cool he's he's an actor that melts into whatever he's doing i've not seen him in a lot but in the few roles i've seen him in he's not a character actor he's he's definitely someone that can can well he can obviously carry a film but similar to tom hanks like you know it's tom tom hanks it looks like tom hanks they've not done a ton with (laughs) i mean outside of wardrobe and and Killian losing some weight, it still looks like Killian Murphy. Like it's, you're not mystified as to who it is, right? Right. There's not a lot of prosthetics or anything like that. And he just disappears. Like he just, it's, you, you don't question it. Now, a lot of that is the writing and the filming and the cinematography, like the whole package just kind of sings together. Um, the other standout role was Robert Downer Jr. Uh, you've not seen him in anything like this before. Yeah, you know, we're also used mm. to him as Iron Man. I don't really watch his like Doctor Doolittle stuff, and the Sherlock movies were fun, but they're just it's it's Iron Man <laughs> in a different time yeah. period. It's really not that different. They're still fun films, but it's not a he's not pushing an envelope like he did in this. And in a way, it was a combination of Robert Downey Jr.'s chops and the writing for his character, who I don't remember the name of. Uh, but a politician that was involved uh, in in what was happening and really well written, really well delivered. And the the timing at which they reveal the plot over the course of the movie to the audience is very, very well measured. And it Hmm. is a long movie, but if you're watching it at home, you can pee whenever you want. (laughs) (laughs) It's one of those films where it is pretty somber the whole way around. It's not like it's going to be an action film. There's a lot of weight behind what they're doing, behind the outcome of what they're doing, uh, the things that they're trying to figure out, the race to try to do it before Russia right? and and the Germans. So there's all this kind of stuff going on. And I, uh, I liked it. Like, it, again, it was not an overly uplifting film, so you kind of have to be in the right mood for it. I think it's an important film to see it raises a lot of questions about state of the world today, but it's not a film you're going to rewatch. I don't think unless you're a film buff and you're watching it for like cinematography and direction, writing, that kind of thing. But like, as it's not like uh, I'll watch any of the Marvel films over again, like countless times. I just, they're on my rotation. Whenever I want a comfort movie, I'll throw in Captain America, Civil War, just because I really like that film. 
and this is not something I'm going to be watching again anytime soon. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there's that to it, but I, I do recommend it. I think it's a, it's a good film to experience. It's a, I mean, it's one of those things where you just can't deny how well it's made, how well it's acted, how well it's written, how well it's done. And, and you're not going to walk away from it going like, well, that was disappointing. <laughs> like yeah. just, just know what you're in for. When you get in there, just know <laughs> it's it's gonna it's not gonna be a ride. It's not a blockbuster in terms of a Hollywood kind of like exciting film. It's more of a a statement piece, but also an important history film as well. So what's uh, what's the other thing on on your list? It was Dune that you went to go see, right? And that's that's a theater experience. You left the house. Oh, I did. Yeah, it was good. I mean, I I think I mentioned on the podcast before. I I use Christmas money I get to buy myself the, the Cineplex sort of annual movie pass, um, which basically gives me a free movie once a month, just because I've, I've over the last two years, I've come to realize when, when movies were taken away, I didn't realize how much I enjoyed being able to go and watch a movie. And, and so, but usually when you go to do it, it's, um, it's, uh, you can use, two passes maximum like one for yourself and one other person and then any other tickets you buy on top of that you get at a discount but but this time um it let me put in all four tickets for free for my family so we, we got to because they had been building up over the last few months so i was able to just you know we had an, a really cool movie experience and all it cost us was the food which isn't cheap <laughs> mind you but it it was a uh, yeah no it was it was good uh it, it basically picks up right where the last one left off. So if, um, I, I use this, this, this website called justwatch.com or the app. And basically it lets you know where you can see different shows on streaming services. And unfortunately this one's not available to stream for free anywhere, or it's not included in any subscription. So you're going to have to rent it, but so the first one, I should say part one, but it was worth renting part one again like a day or two before we went and saw the movie because it brought us right up until where the first one ended and then, and then picked up right, right away and just kept going. It was, uh, yeah, I mean, very much like the first one for me, just visually stunning. Like the color choices were very slick, depending on which world you're on and which people were being highlighted. It was flip-flopping back and forth between some, some very clear sort of color wash choices across the entire thing. And, it was really, I'd say, you know, brilliantly acted, really enjoyed the score. And it's not something I pay attention to a lot, but I just remember the music fitting. Um, you talk about the score often, and then I, I always try to pay attention to it. And so I, I didn't go out of my way to pay attention to it, but there were a couple of points where I felt like, wow, this is really fitting well for me. I, I just, it was, it was good right across the board. Um, it's, you know, like the first one, it was slower paced than a lot of sort of action based movies but it didn't feel like it was slow and dragging on. It just felt like it was being intentional in its slow pace to tell the story. Um, there's, I guess near the end, I'm not sure for how it was for you with uh, Marvel end game or uh, sorry, Avengers end game, but that was three hours and it did not feel like three hours. And then, so this one's two hours and 45 minutes and it's kind of around maybe the two hour and 15 minute mark. I was just feeling like, okay, I'm a little bit tired, but I wasn't, I wasn't bored. I was still enjoying it. I felt that way about the first one. So the first one I missed in theater, I did watch it at home and I'll put a big asterisk here. We have talked about it on the podcast before. I don't remember what episode. I don't remember exactly what I said, but I know part of it would have been complaining about Crave because it was through HBO that oh, I watched yeah. <laughs> it. So part of the experience would have been dealing with the poor image quality and issues that Crave had which would not have been directed at Dune. And I think I probably made a point of that on the podcast to say like, look, I'm griping about this, but this is not Dune's problem. This is my experience problem. And the other thing was though, to your point about being slow, it could have just been the fact that I was at home and there's distractions at home. Like you can, you can go to the bathroom whenever you want and you can get on your phone if you're not particularly engaged in the film. And I do remember having to, like I paused Dune part one at some point, roughly halfway through, I guess, because I was bored and I just like, this is mm. just dragging on and I just want them to move on or move the story forward. And 
I feel like one of the comments I had about part one, which like you said, I haven't seen part two because I do want to drop the five bucks, rent part one, watch it, and then go see part two in theater if I can. Because I'm hearing so many good things about part two, right? It's worth it on the big screen. I, I was really impressed. And then all four members of my family, when we came out, were like, yeah, that was that was really, really cool. I mean, and, and I guess fair warning to everyone, there are three books in the main storyline. So this is very much the second book. So when it ends, like the first movie, it's it's sort of leaning into the third one. Just, just a fair warning. Well, that's good to know. Like, I, I feel like having those expectations and knowing it's like going into the two towers in Lord of the Rings. You know, they're not going to wrap it up. You just you don't know when they're going to end it. You're not sure how they're going to end it. At what point in the adventure are they going to drop you? And I remember us all being disappointed that we didn't get to see Shilob <laughs> in, in two towers like that. that they were oh, ending yeah. it with that little teaser from Gollum in the theaters. And uh like you're like, all right, fine. Like, yeah, that means well, at least you know that the third movie is going to pick up. It's going to start with a bang, <laughs> yeah. The way that it goes, but uh, like those movies all bleed together now that I've watched them so many times at home on the extended version. So uh, there's there are some I think merits to knowing that it's part of a trilogy or whatever going into it. I remember my criticism of the first one was that if it's part one, not that it's book one or that it's called something else it's just it's part one because it was so long it's like did it really need to be two parts like could they have done Mm -hmm. it in in a single film and it sounds like maybe no but at the same time if that's the case maybe they should have done it in three shorter like make a trilogy like star wars you know and just and release it in three in three movie chunks knowing that the next couple of years you're going to get one every christmas or like whatever that is but i looked it up a couple of days ago, just doing the, preparing the notes for this. And so when the, when the first one was done, they didn't know for sure that they were going to get the green, the second and third ones green lit. So it was basically done, but they, they wanted to stay true to the book. So they, they did it as though it was a part one of three, not really knowing. So they wanted to give everything to that film. Um, and if that was going to be all it was, then that was going to be all it was. But um, yeah, I know I just, other than at one point feeling like, okay, it's a little bit long. Um, I don't really have any complaints about this. And like, and you were talking and, and uh, no, sorry, I was thinking something else, but Austin Butler in this. Awesome. Like it, all of the acting was great, but you know, sometimes people are, they perform really well, but they are performing as a version of themselves. Sure. Like Tom, Tom Cruise is excellent in mission impossible, but he's, he's being Tom Cruise. Yeah. And so, you know, you've got T- Timothy Chamelay in this. He's he's got he's good and he's got great presence, but he's he looks like him, and he's like acting a version of him, same as Zendaya and Rebecca Ferguson and and all the others. But Austin Butler is like he's he's done up in makeup, but he is just a completely different character from who he is in real life. Or I guess I shouldn't say I've never met the guy, but I imagine he's not. <laughs> not the uh the same as this character and he 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 nailed it it was just it was really really fun to watch he's very soft-spoken from what i can tell uh i know that when i see some interviews with him unlike jimmy fallon or colbert that i have to turn it up like i have to turn the tv up because i can't hear him (laughs) he's mic'd and i'm sure that they've done sound checks but he just he speaks so softly and he's got a very deep voice I think that's the other thing for me where I'm not champing at the bit to go see it is that I'm, I'm not a big Timothy Chalamet fan. Uh, I didn't find anything that he did in Doom part one blew me away. I was the people that I was excited for. <laughs> mm. I was pretty sure we're not going to be in Dune part two. And I was like, well, that sucks. <laughs> two, two people that I was really interested in seeing what was going to happen with them in, in Dune part one. And they're probably not going to be in Dune part two. So unless there's a flashback. <laughs> so that yeah, kind of took enough. the wind out of my sails too. Um, but, yeah. uh, I, no, I think that's a great way to express what the experience was like and avoid spoilers. Um, and for those, uh, in our chat, uh, M dog 95 is letting us know that there are still some spoilers happening online because the books are so old and then also the movie's been out for a while. So some of those spoiler hats are being lifted. So if you're interested in going to see Dune part two, maybe skip looking up reviews online. Apparently some of them even spoil books. So just FYI, be careful about that kind of stuff. It might be best to do what Stephen is suggesting, which is drop the five bucks, rent Dune part one 
on your favorite streaming app if it's not streaming for free somewhere in, in your vicinity and then go see Doom Part 2 in theater. Well, speaking of Austin Butler, I have been watching Masters of the Air on Apple TV+. Plus. This is a World War II oh, nice. epic miniseries. It is from the same producers as Band of Brothers and The Pacific. That includes Tom Hanks. So it's got that vibe right away. It's, it's unmistakable. The only thing I think is a little bit different for me is that the opening sequence, like the, the credits that roll, like you've got five minutes of show and then they do like the music and they do the, the opening credits and whatnot. There's an awful lot of scenes from what I'm assuming is the rest of the series. And I, 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 I watched it through the once. And then when I realized some of it was pretty action packed, I was like, I don't know if I want to see this right now. Like I kind of want to see this stuff when it happens in the series. So mm. I've been skipping the intro. Uh, I, I, I skipped it. I think after watching about 80% of it. And then now on the second episode, I just skipped it entirely. And what they do is really nice is that they don't skip it completely. They skip to the last three scenes and then the final title. So you still get like the music and the crescendo and like the, and now we're starting, you know, so you get that mm -hmm. vibe, which is cool. Uh, I will say, however, unfortunately, for whatever reason, the Apple TV plus app crashed on me today, midway through episode two. So I haven't finished episode oh. two. Uh, I'm not going to spoil anything anyway, because I haven't seen more than, you know, one and a half episodes. And I, even then I'm not going to spoil what happens in them. But uh, it was disappointing because it's a very engaging show. You get sucked in immediately. And a good part of that is because of the performance from Austin Butler. He's very good as mm. Gail Buck Clevin, who is a major in the U.S. Air Force. And he is competent and confident in the way that you would expect a B-52 bomber pilot to be, but he's not unshakable and he's very thoughtful in a lot of situations. Uh, he's got, I don't know if sure if it's a new girlfriend, but certainly a steady girlfriend. He's the character has a, a, a girl back home and you can tell what he's thinking about when he goes off to war. You can tell what he's thinking about when he's up in the air going through stuff. And it's, it's a really, really good performance. He's also the leader of a squadron of guys. And so he's got responsibilities. He's got people to worry about their mental well-being. You can see a lot of the characters in the film, not just worrying about other people's safety, but also like, how are you doing? Cause mm -hmm. I need all 10 of the people on this plane plane to be ship shape, sharp as a tack. Because if one of us isn't, we're all dead, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. it's, it's got that kind of vibe to it. Um, the only other actor I recognize is Callum Turner as Major John Bucky Egan. He played Theseus Scamander in the Fantastic Beasts films. And I didn't place him at first. I had to look it up, but I recognized him. Mm -hmm. And yes, Buck and Bucky. So Gail Buck Clevin <laughs> and John Bucky Egan. Uh, Bucky Egan gave Buck Clevin his nickname. I don't know why. They, they kind of address it briefly in the first few scenes. I, it's historically accurate, so they have to kind of go with it. And I was, was going to ask that. Yeah, they kind of they kind of go with with a, a jokey way of just like whatever. And then there's also some other scenes later on where other members kind of poke fun at the fact like you couldn't come up with a better nickname. So that kind of stuff. It's almost like it's it's dumb, so it's stuck because it's dumb as opposed to being, you know, unique or special in any way. Right. The rest of the cast is fairly unknown to me. I'm sure they've been in other things, but. It's nice that they are unknown because it allows them all to just melt into the roles. So you don't think about them as like, oh, that's the guy I saw in Smallville or that's the guy that I've seen in this Netflix series or whatever. Like you just like, sure, I'm in. I'll, I'll watch these dudes uh, do their thing. It is visually stunning, mm. filmed in a way that really communicates the stakes and the level of technology that you were dealing with in 1943. I don't know that I've ever been made to feel claustrophobic in a move <laughs> in a show or movie about an airplane. These guys are moving around these B-52 bombers and there's enough room inside the fuselage of these things for two people to stand shoulder to shoulder, not even stand, be in there shoulder to shoulder, kind of crouched over. But if you got to go by one another, like you're kind of climbing over one another, if you've got to go up or down, you're crawling through a tube that's like a foot and a half wide. You know, like none of these guys are big men 
uh, they're not broad shouldered. They're not big muscly dudes. Like they're all slim and, and they have to be, cause you're just, you wouldn't be able to maneuver in the aircraft otherwise. And it's not insulated. Like it is just the metal and the outside. So if you're at interesting 10,000 feet or something like that, it's minus 50 degrees outside and there's nothing but glass and metal between you and the outside world and you're getting shot at. So when someone blows a hole in the side of your plane, it's a hole. <laughs> like, <there's>, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like you can see out of it, you know? Uh, and it's not pressurized. So it's like in an aircraft these days, you know, if there's a hole in it, like there's that, there's, there's a problem with the pressure in the cabin and all this other kind of stuff. This is just like, it's, just, it's a flying tin can, like a tin can is a, maybe a poor way to say it. Cause these things were known as flying fortresses, but they, they only have, I think a handful of them that are actually in, the, in the series. The rest of them are all CG and stuff like that. But like, you can barely tell and the cinematography and the scale you think like, cool, B-52 bomber. Yeah, I know what that is. I've seen one or two of those, you know, in a film before. You haven't seen 40 of these things flying across the sky. Mm. Combine that with the score. And then you know how the Germans are fighting them. You know what the stakes are. It's all the stuff. And I, I really enjoy what I've seen so far. It's not edge of your seat. It's not an anxious watch, but you're definitely sucked in and the characters that you get to know are likable. So you don't want anything to happen to them. And whenever they're up in the air, anything could happen to anybody. So mm, yeah, okay. there is that kind of, that kind of edgy, edgy watch, right? What I do like about it for people that are not history buffs is one of the airmen, I think it's one of the navigators. It's either Blakely or Murphy. I can't really remember which one is giving you voiceover from time to time during the show. And it's spoken to you like they're writing a memoir or they're writing a letter home and letting somebody else know about who are the men that they're out at war with. Like, what's it like in the mess hall? What are the tendencies of these people? Where are they from? Like all this kind of stuff. And what's nice about that is if you get someone's name in dialogue briefly as they're introduced to a superior officer or whatever. Also in the military, half the time people are being referred to as their last name. And then the other half the time they're being referred to as their nickname. And then when you first meet them, you're given their birth name. And so you've got to figure out which goes with which and who. And (laughs) this dialogue, this voiceover reiterates that because like one episode might have a couple of stories or a couple of tidbits about two particular people. And because of that, you'll end up having their name spoken to you a couple more times than the dialogue would allow Cause in dialogue, it would feel really hokey. Like if I was calling you Steven every five minutes, <laughs> it, would, it would be strange. Right. Whereas like on the radio, they just call like navigation. Give me the, give me the, the details. Like where do I, where am I going? Give me a heading. They don't say the person's name. They just call out their, their designation, their position on the ship. And so it feels much more natural in that way when you're watching it. But then you are like, who's on navigation? And then right. it's like, you'll get like a little side note. It's like, yeah, so this guy on navigation, he was this and he was that and blah, blah, blah. And you're like, oh, right. That's Murphy or that's, you know, whoever. And I, and I think that it's really well done because it doesn't feel hokey. It doesn't feel forced because of the way that he's reading it. It's, it's written to someone it's written and spoken as if someone else is going to be reading this later. And so it's, it's good mm-hmm. in that way. And, and it means that you're not lost even after, you know, the first episode, you're still on board with everything, but the, the weight of the series, I think is going to be interesting. I think it's going to be a heavy watch. It's, I, I, I'm assuming because of the production company and the people involved that it's historically accurate as best as they possibly can. And the, I guess, situation that they're in is America and Britain are trying to bomb the Germans and try to get onto the continent in world war II. So Currently, America and Britain don't really have boots on the ground on continental Europe. These bombing runs are trying to like kick down the front door, essentially. And it's not an easy task. And so they're getting into why. I think mostly in episode two, they were kind of getting into the nitty and gritty of like, what's the strategy? Is it working? What do they have to adjust going forward? The first show was mostly kind of an introduction to the characters, but I highly recommend it. It's, It's very, very well made from what I can tell so far. 
Moving on into the Internet Minute, which is brought to you by you, dear listener. The Citadel Cafe is listener supported. If you're getting a little bit of value out of the show, please consider putting a little bit of value back in. You can become a member at patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe. Joining at any level will get you an invite to the member-only Discord server. That's shared with my personal Discord, so people from Twitch are also in there. You can access the Barista Cut bonus audio, the extended version of the podcast, when we do have time to record some extra audio. Special thanks to our Bean Counter patrons, Cosmic and Smurf588. Thank you ever so much for the support on this episode. Patron count is at 25, which is steady on from the last time we recorded. Our goal each time we sit down is to have one more patron than the time before. If you would like to be patron number 26, visit patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe. So Stephen's pick was already thrown out at the uh, top of the show because of the relation to ASL, but I have mm. a Lego pick because... We all need one from time to time. (laughs) And I am nothing if not consistent. This is the Lego Ideas Dungeons and Dragons set. Set number 21348 retails for a whopping $469 Canadian. 3,745 pieces, 19 inches high, 15 inches wide and 12 inches deep. It is not a small kit. Six minifigs, including a dwarf cleric gnome fighter, orc rogue, and an elf wizard. Buildable monsters include an owl bear, a gelatinous cube, which is very well done, <laughs> I have to say, and the cinder howl red dragon. It's available on April 6th, so it's not out yet, but it is coming soon. Celebrating D&D's 50th anniversary with this Lego set, which is set to launch with some critically charismatic D&D players. There's actually a session that's being done live around this set. And the game master for that session is Mm. Lucas Bolt, who is the original designer who submitted the set to Lego's ideas. So very cool set. I, um, I'm not a big enough D and D fan where this is going to be on my shelf, but I can see somebody that's been playing D and D for a while, seeing all the little teasers and tidbits and bits and bobs in here and getting really excited. It seems to have just about everything that you would have in a, D&D campaign. You know, there's treasure, there's traps, there's a dragon, there's all the different minifigs. Um, the gelatinous cube <laughs> inside of it has a minifig head that's painted like a skull. <laughs> and the whole thing's transparent. So there's like a floating skull inside the gelatinous cube. It's very, it's very funny. I, uh, I really got a, a kick out of that. And uh, it just gets a lot of points for me for being so whimsical, so true to what I, you know, from what I know through pop culture, uh, to the game and yet still unapologetically Lego. Yeah. And even the buildable monsters look pretty cool. Like the owl bear is something you have to construct and it looks great. And the dragon looks really cool. I was just looking at that too. The dragon looks really well done. Very nice. Well, that is it for this episode of the Citadel Cafe. You can get more information about the show and links to some of the things that Stephen and I talked about at the citadelcafe.com. Music for the show was composed by Kevin McLeod. You can email the show at thecitadelcafe at gmail.com or find the show by name on social media. Subscribe for free on all the major podcasting platforms that includes YouTube. The RSS feed and the show notes are available on our website, thecitadelcafe.com. Word of mouth is the easiest way to support the show. Just tell friends about the Citadel Cafe and where they can go to listen to it. My name is Joel Duggan, and you can find everything that I am doing online at joelduggan.com. That includes a link to the other podcast I do called The Spawn Chunks, which is all about Minecraft. We are going to be interviewing Mojang developer Ulraf this coming week on the show, so that'll be fun. You can check that out every Monday on all of your favorite podcasting platforms. I'm Joel Duggan on Twitch, very easy to find, and Joel Duggan on social media. I normally stream Thursday through Sunday, but I've been really pushing to finish West Hill on the Citadel SMP server So look for me just about any time during the week. I do usually stream around 1 p.m. Atlantic, which is UTC minus four hours. Stephen, where can people find you online? For the most part, I will be on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Stephen ESE. Hoping to put up a stream in the next week in a bit, but it's, it's been a little while, but life has been busy. But yeah, find me there. You've been listening to the Citadel Cafe, where we are fast, easy, and cheap, but you can only pick two.